A knock sounds on my door shortly before curfew that night, and I open it to find Soleil. I step back to let her in. Once I've closed the door, I ask, You do remember that the first inner circle meeting of the year isn't until tomorrow night, right? Of course, I have something to report, she says. Okay, I look at her expectantly. Garrick told me to hang around near the infirmary after dinner and try to gather any updates I could about Sorengale, Soleil explains. She just left there with her arm in a sling and headed back toward the barracks a few minutes ago. I need to go, I say, making for the door. Good work, I tell her as I leave. Back to the barracks? Surely just to collect her belongings before transferring to the scribe quadrant, right? You don't think they would have assigned someone else to do that for her? Sigail prompts. Maybe not if she wanted to say goodbye to that friend of hers, I hypothesize. You're grasping. She said the arm was in a sling, not a cast, Sigail reminds me. So? That just means Nolan mended her. He's done it countless times before, I reason. It's assessment day, Sigail states. Mending an injury that severe would have required a significant amount of time and half his energy. If she were bound for the scribe quadrant, they would have forced her to make do with healers and lehas serum for a day or two until the mender could work through the backlog of rider cadets. Fuck! I rage inwardly. Indeed, Sigail agrees. I reach the ground floor of the dorms and continue on into the first year barracks in no time. I don't bother hiding as I walk through the men's chamber, simply moving with authority. I cloak myself in shadow as I enter the women's chamber and keep to the naturally darker areas along the walls. I quickly spot Sorengale looking at a letter and focus my power on her. An image of her sister Mira and an overwhelming instinct of gratitude fills my mind. She's thankful that her sister armed her with what she'd need to survive in the writer's quadrant, in more ways than one. She sets down the note and says something to the friend she traded boots with before parapet. Then she picks up a journal, and I see a picture in my mind's eye depicting the Book of Brennan. There's a subconscious motivation so powerful, I find it staggering. A fierce intention to survive against any odds, and a momentary general sense of peace and confidence. Well, shit. I make my way back up to my room. We've been going about things the wrong way with Imogen. I tell Bodhi and Garrick in my room about ten minutes before she's supposed to report. You think? Garrick says. I sigh. Okay, I've been going about things the wrong way. It's just hard for me. Even before the apostasy failed, I already thought of her almost like a little sister. And then after what we all went through together at that point, I never wanted to let her anywhere near that kind of danger or heartache again. You're gonna have to get over that. She's stuck in the God's damned writer's quadrant. She's going to be fucking tortured this year, but she can take it, Garrick says confidently. I know. I still wish she didn't have to, but it's not like she hasn't already endured far worse, I admit. I'd thought that maybe I could protect her from the very worst of what's coming, but frankly, she'll be one of our best assets to save everyone from it. So from now on, I'll do my best to prepare her for it instead. And what about your general demeanor towards her? Bodhi inquires. You should know by now that she doesn't exactly respond to the harsh disciplinarian approach. Well, we'll still need to lay down the law whenever she inevitably goes rogue, but generally, yeah, that's good advice we could probably all benefit from keeping in mind, I say, glancing at Garrick, who responds with a look that is skeptical to say the least. To kill time until she arrives, we begin making plans for the meeting in ten days with all of the marked first years, debating the boring logistics of getting all the new cadets to the specific tree and so on. Eventually, I feel Imogen approaching through the shadows outside the room. I open the door and she comes in with her arms crossed, clearly prepared for a fight. Let's see if I can head that off right now. I was wrong, Imogen. I'm sorry. I say with all sincerity. The look on her face clearly shows that she wasn't expecting that, and she's on the back foot for a moment before reassembling her snarky expression and asking skeptically, You're going to let me kill Sorengale? Gods, she's not going to make this easy, is she? No, not about that. Her life is still mine to handle, and we'll get to the fact that you deliberately disobeyed my order about that in a bit. But first, I need to open up to you about a couple of things. I begin. 
I was probably wrong to have kept you out of the private meetings and what we're doing in that regard, but I was definitely wrong not to tell you that it wasn't because I don't think you were up to the task or good enough to be a part of the inner circle. It was because I was trying to protect you from what we're doing. Why the fuck would you do that? Imogen demands. Because I don't know if I could handle seeing you get hurt too badly again, I say simply. That actually shuts her up for once. I know now that was a bad instinct, because we're going to need you, I tell her sincerely, but you're also going to have to meet me halfway. She immediately hits me with the Imogen glare again. That right there, I say, pointing at her face. That's what I'm talking about. None of our other people would ever dare give me that kind of look. How close we've been in the past is causing problems from both directions in this new scenario we're in now, Imogen. I'm basically the leader of this revolution. At the very least, I'm in charge of the stuff that's going on here at Bazgayeth. I know you're smart enough to have caught on to the fact that we're doing things to advance the cause around here, and if you want in on it, you have to respect me as your superior officer and obey my fucking orders. You didn't even ask if I was trying to disobey them. For your information, I wasn't actually planning to kill her with my dagger. I fix her with my own skeptical look, as does Garrick from the edge of the bed where he's sitting. What? She says defensively. People can live without half their intestines. Gods, Imogen. He said you were free to hurt her as badly as you wanted without any risk of killing her. Garrick says reproachfully, staring at the floor with his head in his hands. Imogen rolls her eyes. Do you see how I'm making an effort here and you're just being as stubborn as ever? I ask. That's why I'm still not comfortable letting you in on the classified stuff yet. She opens her mouth furiously to argue, but I cut her off. Which is not to say that I won't. If, I say, putting a finger up, you prove you're willing to make an effort too. I know that I'll never be able to tame that tongue of yours, but actions speak louder than words. Garrick pointed out that a lot of the new first years look up to you already, and that you're one of our best fighters. You could be an invaluable asset in keeping them alive if you'd be a mentor to them. Psh, easy. I would have done that anyway. She says dismissively, but I notice her lightning-quick glance at Garrick, who's shaking his head at the ceiling now. The look on her face in that instant contains something besides snark. Good, I say, trying to remove the frustration from my tone. I know you have zero respect for authority, so I don't expect you to express deference to us or anything, but you will at least follow orders from now on. And I've seen how you show incredible patience with younger ones, so with those that look up to you as an authority, I expect you to behave accordingly. If you start acting like you belong in the leadership ranks, and keep it up for more than a few days just to get what you want, then I'll consider letting you in on the classified stuff in a month or two. Done. She agrees with a sincere expression on her face for once. Okay then, Garrick and Bodhi, you're both dismissed, I tell them. They leave without a word. You need to tell me something that's too classified for them to hear this time? Imogen asks sarcastically after the door closes. Well, classified isn't exactly the right word, but otherwise, yeah, kinda, I respond. She looks at me skeptically. I saw something earlier that made me realize that being a bad commander isn't the only thing I need to apologize for, I tell her, as I'm sure you'd agree. I pause for a few beats to give her the opportunity to take over, but she just crosses her arms and waits expectantly. You know I'm not good at this kind of thing, and it might make you feel better to just let me fucking have it, I try to prompt her. This room is soundproofed. I wait another beat, and when she still doesn't respond, I begin preparing to make an absolute ass of myself. But then... I missed you so fucking much. I can barely even hear her whisper. I was 16 when they sent us off to be fostered. I appreciated your letters so much, but they just made me that much more excited to see you again when we finally got here together. But once I did, you weren't... you! Her eyes are shining like she's about to cry, and I lower my own. It's like you've disappeared behind your fucking commander mask. This, right now, is the first real conversation we've had in five years, Zayden. She says, throwing her arms up. I thought I'd finally have you back, but once you were finally physically present again, I've still just... missed you. 
I look up again, and she lets her arms fall in exasperation. I walk towards her. She looks confused and keeps her eyes on me while turning her head slightly and pulling it back uncomfortably as I approach her. I hug her. She remains frozen in shock for several heartbeats. Finally, her arms clutch me fiercely in return. I turn my head and place my cheek on top of her head. I've missed you too, Emmy. I whisper. Hey, I hope you're liking my fanfiction. If you want to be notified when the next chapter gets posted, make sure to subscribe and click the bell. And if you want to read along or would just prefer a text version, you can find it online at Archive of Our Own. There's a link to it in the video description. Feel free to let me know what you think or provide constructive feedback in the comments. I always try to reply to any that allow me to share explanations of how I was thinking about specific parts of the narrative. And then I just wanted to make clear that all rights belong to Rebecca Yaros and thank her for creating this incredible world. Thanks for listening.